This is my home flight sim pit, simulator cockpit that I built. This is the design that I've been working on for at least since five years ago. And this is the recent most current build. Um, it is essentially, it's a box, as you can see from the outside. Um, it's a six foot long from the wall there to the back by four feet wide, by four feet tall. So it gives a good bit of um, space on the, uh, on the interior. Still a little bit cramped, but not as badly cramped as say a real Cessna 172 uh, fuselage per se. But this is the, the design setup. It's all made using two by two studs. Um, and I built the whole thing to be very modular. Um, and I mean to say I can take it all apart very quickly and move it um, wherever I want to move it or work on, on something. So this is the outside view. Explain a little bit of how the construction worked. I essentially have three main components that make up this structure. I've got the walls. This is the left wall and the right wall over there and the roof wall or the top roof rather. Um, and they all come apart very easily. You can see I have these little um, notches here holding the roof in place. And I've got some long three inch bolts going through the structure there in the middle and over there. So I have to do is take these bolts apart. These three pieces essentially come apart. So, it, so the left wall stands by itself, the roof as well as the right. And I can easily move it around like that. And with that inside, you've got the chairs as well. They just um, slide in and out. So that's the modular aspect of the design. And I incorporated this throughout, um, as you see, once we go on the inside as well. So one of the biggest things I, asked, I get asked about is the views um, and how I have that set up. So from the front, most people assume I use a projector, but I don't. This is a 55 inch 4K uh, cheap TV that I sourced a few years ago. Um, probably due for an upgrade at some point, but it works just fine. Um, so that's the front view. You can see I, I do have it angled at a 15 degree angle. And you see, once we go on the inside, why that makes a lot more sense than just having it sitting up straight. So that's the side view. That's how I do the side view. It's bigger than the frame. And that helps with the peripheral view on the inside. You can see there's a little bit of protrusion from the left side top as well as on this side here. The side views, how I have that set up is on the left and right walls. On the inside here, I do have a 32-inch 2K PC monitor, it's not a TV, it's a monitor. Uh, as you can see, the cable is going through there. That's the display port cable and power cable is going through down there. Um, and this will make more sense when I show how this is set up on the right side wall, because on this side, I actually do not have it closed in because, well, this is against the window and no one ever sees here, but you can see there's an identical monitor there that is on the left side. It's the 32 inch 2K screen and I just have it resting against the frame held in place by these little bars here. Um, and it just works like that. So that's how the views work. So 32 inch monitors left and right and 55 inch 4K TV on the front. This is the PC that powers the entire flight simulator. It's a single computer. And the build is a Ryzen 5900X processor paired with a an RTX 3090 Ti uh, graphics card with a 32 gig, 3600 megahertz RAM, um, and a total of about eight terabytes of storage on there. Four terabytes is M.2 storage with uh, um, nine, Samsung 980 Pro M.2s, uh, one in the front right under there and one in the back of the motherboard. So the one in the back is a 970, not a 980. And I also have two, um, two terabyte SSDs behind this display panel here. So it gives me a total of about eight terabytes. And with that, between using this PC as my uh, as the main driver, the only driver as a matter of fact for the flight simulator, as well as um, my general purpose gaming, because I didn't just build it for the flight sim pit, I can easily unplug the cables there, pick it up, this very handy handle right here and just move it to my gaming station. And that's what, um, um, I used to play all my Steam games on there as well. So lots of storage for that purpose. Um, and the case is a Slager S620 um, 
ITX case, so it's a very compact build. Um, I didn't necessarily want to have a big PC, uh, a big case rather, because like I said, I, I wanted to have this one as the main computer um, that I can use here with my flight simulator and also move it around the house um, and use it for gaming or even my racing rig as well. So, quick overview of the PC there on the back. As you can see, the power, power cable there, all the display ports, just four display ports. And once we get inside, I'll explain a little bit of how I'm able to power more than four um, display devices, but just four ports and then two data cables here. Two USB 3.0 cables going to uh, 16 port powered USB hubs, and that's where everything is connected to. Um, so that's a quick overview of the PC that powers the entire flight simulator. This is the PC with the side panel back on. And here's a quick view of how the sim pit looks from the outside when you're standing right at the entrance. And before we go in there, these are the two seats that I built. Um, these are from passenger buses. <laughs> and uh, what I did was I just, this used to be paired together, kind of like in a uh, bench seat, and I took the base off and built these um, individual bases here out of two by three studs, bought it all together, and they've been working pretty well, going on to six years now, um, and they work just fine. So as you can see on the pilot seat here, I've got some uh, bass shakers. Um, what these things do is they use the sound from the computer and are able to generate very low frequency sound which translates into vibrations and those vibrations travel throughout this frame base and into the chair and it kind of feels like this almost the vibration so when the engine is rolling and I'm accelerating I feel some of that feedback and it just it just helps with a little bit more immersion um, from that point of view so two seats they will just sit there just slide right out and I squeeze in there. So the design concept I mentioned earlier, everything is modular. As I talked about on the outside, the right wall, the roof and the left wall can easily come apart. And when that happens, what I'm left with is um, the panel frame build itself uh, that houses everything. And the whole thing moves as a single unit. Um, and I can move that around and the front TV comes down as well and the panel itself is Modular in the sense that I can work on each individual uh, parts of it um, And I'll touch a little bit more on, onto that. So I do have this is my uh, Pilot side here. There's a middle section um, right section for um, Co-pilot and then the bottom section bottom middle and bottom over here as well and two rider pedals down. The, the idea was to keep everything entirely modular. So I don't necessarily have to break the whole thing down. If I wanted to do some upgrades or work on it or move it around uh, the house to a different location. Initially I had it upstairs in my house and then I moved it down here in this corner. Um, and that took all about maybe 30 minutes to get everything done. So the views, as I explained a little bit earlier, the side views um, are two 32 inch 2K monitors, identical monitors for the right view and the left view. And the front view is a 55 inch 4K TV. And everything is running at 60 Hertz. I don't necessarily need anything more than that for um, flight simulator. Um, and how I have the view set up, we're sitting here in the very lovely uh, Cessna 182 Skyline from A2A Simulations. Um, and this is the aircraft that I pretty much fly 99% of the time. Um, I have a lot of other aircraft that I could fly, the nature of flight simulation, but this is the one where I spend my time in. Um, so how I set up the view, we're sitting in this aircraft and this is in Prepare 3D, P3D V5. 5.3, I believe, is the version that I'm on right now. Um, I can run X-Plane, I can run Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 as well, but when I built this Simpit originally, it was designed around P3D and it's very optimized for P3D. Uh, the other simulators work just fine, but not at 100% integration with all these knobs and switches and gauges and systems. So P3D is the main same driver and uh, paired with Orbex scenery, it gives me everything I need. So the views, 
in Prepare 3D to set up these views is pretty straightforward. Um, I just create a new view, undock it, drag it to this side, modify the zoom, modify the rotation, the vertical axis and all that to get it to exactly where I want it to be. And then do the same on the front and then the left. And the idea is to get near perfect alignment at this angle right here. So what you're seeing here is the front view and the right view coming into intersection there at this um, bezel or rather gap between the screens. Um, and it's set up so that when I'm looking around this way as I'm flying, my peripheral view kind of sort of integrates that into one huge surround view. The structures kind of look off a little bit until you go at the right angle or the perfect angle to sort of show that. But when you're on the runway or flying in the air, everything lines up very perfectly. And again, my peripheral view eliminates a lot of that because most of the time when I'm flying, my view is on the front. The right and left are used for, especially in VFR uh, maneuvering. I'm looking over there and through the process, my brain is eliminating this gap here and it just all blends in. I set up these views where it goes right up against the window because I have this frame built on the inside. So I don't necessarily want to see the uh, virtual cockpit of the aircraft on any of the views. And it works like that. Let's take a look at the avionics first and the systems. This is the uh, main PFD, it's the G1000 unit. And this particular unit is uh, designed and made by Simeonic. This is a Simeonic G1000. And it's, this is actually an iPad. It's powered by an iPad. So I can go you know, easier to show than, than talk about it. And the way it works is I have the iPad app here and the iPad is sitting inside this bezel. And this bezel is Bluetooth connected to the iPad and is always constantly plugged into the power back there to power the whole thing and keep the iPad always charged. Um, and when I open the app, it fills up the entire screen um, and I end up with a G1000 unit. And the unit itself talks to the flight simulator on my computer um, through uh, over Wi-Fi, as you can see, just connected right now when I opened it. Um, and there's a, a small application that sits on the computer that listens over Wi-Fi to this device and they just talk back and forth over the uh, SIM Connect um, um, network with a, with a flight simulator. It just works very well. I don't have to worry about dragging this G1000 window from the virtual cockpit onto a secondary monitor, and it also spares me an HDMI port. As I mentioned earlier, I have a lot of screens here, and I only have four HDMI ports off of that 3090 Ti. So this is the G1000 unit from Simeonic. I have a lot of these uh, Log SciTech Logitech flight instrument panels. I like these devices a lot because they're very flexible with the right drivers and uh, software powering them. The uh, default instruments or drivers that come with are completely useless. And uh, I always recommend anyone who has even a single one of these get spat.next right away. Um, and start going through the customization aspect of these devices. You can get a lot of third, uh, third party custom gauges. That's what I'm running here. Most of my gauges here are from FSX Times. Um, they make a lot of good gauges for uh, P3D, X-Plane, as well as Flight Simulator. And um, you can use them directly loaded onto the devices. You can use spat.next. I always default to spat.next. Um, but these devices work very well um, with the right drivers, as I said. And all these buttons become highly customizable. You can use them to control anything, including keyboard uh, buttons using spad.next. So I have one, two, three up there for the campus, four, five. Um, and these here show me the engine um, for the 182, Cessna 182, the fuel flow and manifold pressure. And on this side, I've got the RPM gauge, uh, and uh, this is a backup um, um, PFD uh, device. Um, the next main component here would be the uh, GTN 750 GPS right here in the center console. Um, and this, the way I have this running is, this is the Reality XP GTN 750 software. I haven't I have it installed in the uh, A2S Cessna 182, and this is a pop-up gauge of it. Touchscreen 
um, eight inch monitor that I have here in horizontal format. And it works very beautifully to simulate the G1000. Again, this is a Reality XP software that's running on there. If you're not familiar with your added XP, you can look them up real quick. They, they make the GNS430 and 500, as well as the uh, GTN 750 and 650 units. And um, they're honestly one of the best ones um, as far as simulated units out there. So that's how this works. And that's how I made that work. I just got an eight inch monitor, flipped it on its side. Um, and I dragged and dropped that screen over here. And this is a test screen monitor. It, and here, this is the JPI 930 gauge. I like this gauge because it's very universal. There's, I just popped out Air Manager right there. As you can see, that's how I have it set up. If you're not familiar with Air Manager, you can create these panels and just display them on any screen that is connected to your computer. You can see I have one, two, three, four, five, and a custom six uh, screens showing on, on there. And I can move this panel to any screen and just have Air Manager running in the background simulating that connected to the flight simulator. And this is a screen where I have that display. So that gives me the, the JPI 930 in engine gauge. Um, so that's Air Manager running there. Um, that, that these devices are controlled, uh, the FIPS are controlled by SPAD.next. This is Reality XP GTN 750, and that's Semionic G1000. So that kind of goes over the Avionic systems in here. Next on the panel, obviously, would be the yolks. This is the Yoko Yolk primary yolk that I have here. I like this yolk very much. Now, I would very much love to have a, what do you call this, a force feedback yolk. Um, the cost of those things is a whole nother matter, but if I can get my hands on one, I would. The next best thing to that is the Yoko Yolk. It feels very natural. Um, it does not have any detents to it. It's very heavy. It's all steel build um, and it has a very nice long travel and uh, it, it is same concept of spring loaded but instead of a spring on the inside of the chassis they, they actually have high uh, what do you call those tension um, ropes so I don't get any of that clicking from a spring but I also get this very natural resistance and it gets heavier the more you go to the edges. So it doesn't quite do the food in any degrees, but it goes, it goes all the way up there. I think this is either 83 or 87, I'm not sure. I'm just making that number up. But it gives me nice travel and just nice control overall. On the co-pilot side, this is an old school yoke that is not in production anymore. Oats was made by uh, Golf Light. They don't produce this yoke anymore. I used it for a lot of years. This has a very, uh, flimsy kind of spring in there um, uh, and it provides a shorter travel but it still works a whole lot better compared to the plastic side take yolks um, that were available at the time there's a lot more yolk options today that I would have gone with versus this but I got this four or five years ago and it was a, it was a very good option at the time and again it's all steel construction as well but it just sits there um, as the backup yolk and uh, the other thing on the panel would be the switches. So there's a few switches everywhere. On the pilot side at the bottom here, we've got the Cessna style switch panel. This is from Aviation Training Foundation. This is one of the recent additions I just made to the sim. I used to have an, an auto design uh, switch panel here. As a matter of fact, this is backlit. If I turn on the, uh, the little light there that I used to control, the backlighting because the backlighting is on all the time even if I turn on the PC because this is connected to the USB hub and not directly onto the PC. So that little mod there gets that taken care of. So I like that it's backlit as you can see. Um, all the buttons here uh, fully functional and replicated in the same. This is a spring loaded switch that I have here but this is not the switch that this panel comes with. I didn't necessarily like the switch that the panel comes with. It's out there somewhere. So I took it off and I got the switch that Simeonic makes, the same company that makes this G1000, they make a switch. Um, it's about 30 US dollars, but it does, sh it ships out of China, so it ends up being about twice the price of that to get it to your doorstep. But it's a much, much better construction. I wish I made a quick review video when I was doing that change to show how that works. But I like it, I like the, the, this switch a, a lot better than the switch that comes with this panel by default. 
Now the one it comes with again is still a spring loaded switch and it works just fine. But it 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 was just binding on me. When you go to, to start and back, it would either not go back uh, or you'll be stuck or you lose the spring springiness altogether. It was just very uh, iffy when using versus this here you can see every time I go to start it springs right back to both um, and it works just like that all the time with the same amount of force on that switch on that uh, spring so this works a lot better this switch from Simeonic. Down here the other thing we have is these um, brake lever I have here this is the little remote switch for my lights under the panel um, and another main component here is the TPM, the throttle, prop, and mixture launcher. I, I get a lot of questions about this. So what I wanted to do is actually just more than talk about it, actually show how this works. So let me do this real quick. So this is my TPM module. These are real Cessna Rainier control units. These are not 3D printed. These are the real things. I got this off of eBay a long time ago. So that's the throttle. Uh, it's adjustable, I can adjust the tension, I can lock it all the way to where it's not even moving, just like in the real aircraft, or loosen it up. This is the prop control. As you can see, it doesn't move until I press the release in the middle. So I can move it that way, and it also has the fine adjustment of twisting um, anti-clockwise to move it out, and clockwise to move it back in. And mixture, same thing. It's locked until you press the middle button to move it in and out. And it also has the fine adjustment as well. Now, the reason these work like the real thing is because, well, they are the real controls from the real aircraft. How I have these hooked up to the simulator is this very simple mechanism right here. And that's why I opened that panel. You can see when I move the mixture, this is the back here. The red is the mixture, this unit. Um, I cut off the excess cables. These come with a very long, what, four foot cable, uh, steel metal cable. I had to cut that off and also cut the internal little wire piece to a desired length that I wanted at the time. And what I did is I hooked that up to these 100 millimeter slide potentiometers. I have three of them, one for the throttle, prop, uh, for, for the prop, and for the mixture over here. And so when I move this in and out, all I'm doing back here is just sliding the knob on that potentiometer. And I have those potentiometers connected to this USB controller here, down here. And all it's doing is just reading the resistance of that pot, the slide pot, and translating that into an axis. And I simply go into the simulator and assign that axis. So I get throttle using the real throttle module, prop using the real prop module, as well as mixture. So that's how that works. You see the motorized trim wheel? Um, it's made by Sim Parts Universal by a guy named Richard Hume. He's out of uh, Europe somewhere and he has a, a Facebook page where he puts all his information. In. But I like this trim wheel because, like I said, it's motorized. You can see there it moves and um, when it's moving, the uh, indicator moves as well. And in cases of flying with autopilot, which I don't actually do that much. This is able to sync up with the flight sim um, autopilot. Uh, I'm in the process of modifying the center panel um, as I'm preparing to do some upgrades. So what's going to happen, what I'm planning on doing is take this unit out entirely. I'll probably um, modify this to a, to a very slim single one, one and a half inch or so module where I'll have these six switches there because I like these switches. and. I've always had these switches assigned to the battery alternator, bus one and bus two, even though I have this um, full Cessna style panel down here, I still like to use those in a, in a case. And also, I can also assign them to anything else, such as landing gear if I'm flying an airplane that has a landing gear. And in case of the Cessna 182, the car flaps, I have that assigned to this one. So it helps me, it allows me to open up the, the car flaps quickly that way. Um, so I plan on keeping these buttons um, I'll have them further down here, but what's going to replace this entire space here is uh, These devices here Which are also from Sim parts universal. Let me put them up here 
This is an audio panel. It's a fully integrated unit, USB. And this is a transponder unit. And this is the GTX 335 slash 335 transponder. It simulates that very well. And it also has a little bit more extra functionality. Um, I'll do a quick walkthrough of these at some, at some point once I, I finish the rebuild and I have them integrated in there. I've already fully tested them. They work very well. Um, I wanted to have this audio panel even though the G1000 has a built-in uh, audio panel there and I've always used that but I just I like the idea of having an actual one. So what, what I'm going to do is move this G1000 unit a little bit further down and KMA28 audio control unit will sit up there which you typically find um, in, uh, in, 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 in real airplanes more and the G1000 will move down a little bit and then the transponder, I'm gonna plug that right at the bottom of the G1000, giving me a, a slightly better um, configured uh, center panel here. And on top of that, I also have a few more little pieces that, that I will be integrated into that rebuild. I have this little unit here. This is a, an annunciator unit, again, also from, from Sim Parts Universal very nice little unit usb connected it has three components to it they're all kind of dangly right now but let me do this here so that's the annunciator unit right there and it also has this little gps nav toggle button attached to it and this nice little handy switch which um you can test all the uh, annunciators and also you can dim the lights if they're too bright or keep them at you know the middle position which is a bright position so i'll be integrating this into the panel as well uh, haven't figured out <laughs> figured out where i don't want to move the g1 uh, the, the gtn 750 all the way down otherwise i would have done that and put the annunciators at the top then the audio but i'll probably have them go out there somewhere so that's what's happening here and part of that is i've always constantly kept this this hobby active by also modifying the build as much as I use it. I also very much like to work on things. Um, hence going back to my point I brought up earlier of I built everything to be modular. So in this case, I don't have to do anything more to the whole uh, sim pit or the panel rather. Um, I'll be working just on the this black center uh, section and really only two parts. This one here that's holding the, the GTN 750 and this one that's holding this switch panel. Everything else will stay there. I'll take those two out, uh, redesign them, uh, hook everything up and then just pop them right back in there and uh, keep on moving. So that's how the modularity of my Simpit works. Uh, down here also I have a flap switch. Self-explanatory moves the flop one notch up and down and this is a Cessna style so you get four notches all the way to full and four notches all the way back some empty space there i have filled up with some uh dummy circuit breakers i'll probably do something different with that at some point and uh on this side this switch here controls my panel fans i have one there and one there and these are actually functional i think you can hear them running they move a fairly good bit of air when it's getting toasty in here and this little fan back here is not doing it i can use that and i try to make this a little bit more interesting by setting that switch up to look like the uh, emergency landing transmitter um, switch but it's not it just controls the, uh, the fans there but that's just part of making this thing feel a little bit more uh, lifelike with all these uh, writings i have across the uh the panel here maneuvering speed some passenger warning signs uh quick takeoff checklist uh, tail sign. I should have a no smoking sign in here somewhere as a matter of fact. At the bottom there we got two rider pedals. Um, these are both the uh, SciTech or Logitech rider pedals. These have always worked very well for my design and my use case and I, I, I did the mod to have the Cessna style pedals there and that works really well. As you can see that one still has the default. The space I have down here doesn't just doesn't work for a lot of different rider pedals. The newer rider pedals have just gotten bigger and bigger, and that's a little bit disappointing because this size with the side tech has always worked fairly well. I'm six foot three. I'm not a small guy, but 
my feet are always comfortable on this um, as you can see the newer pedals I, I, I had one of the new ones here recently I ended up returning them my feet were this far apart for whatever reason and all the way forward here and they were this tall so it just doesn't make sense so I, I've always uh, stayed with the side tech pedals on top here you can see I do have some radio panels here that they're not primary uh, devices rather they're just showing me some extra information here these are devices I had from before I started customizing everything uh, the way it is um, so instead of just throwing them in a box somewhere I found a different use for them so for instance on here I can see what my FPS is currently when I'm flying what my uh, uh, touchdown vertical speed would be ground elevation ground velocity um, ADF radio there just as a secondary, secondary backup and fuel information and this is all powered using spot spad.next and I can show any kind of information that I want on these displays time you name it anything that's how uh, how much of a um, useful software spad.next is so that's what these do up there the other thing I get asked about a lot on, the, on my flight simulator build is this here the glare shield question is always how did you make that fairly simple actually um, this is just resting on the frame that is behind this panel I built the frame as a whole unit and the panels as, as I mentioned earlier they come out individually this whole piece comes out the bottom piece comes out the center panel is divided into smaller pieces and those and what I'm left with back there is a skeleton framework of what this whole structure looks like um, and this glare shield just rests rests on top of that the way i made the glare shield as you can see it's not it's not solid it's a little bit squishy and it's also kind of flexible and to the touch feels like hard soft leather because what i have under there is uh, just some foam mats from home depot that i got high density flexible foam mats and i bent them and glued this leatherite material it's brown it kind of looks like black but it is brown a dark brown i glued it onto um, uh, the fall mats and there's two of them one is a you can put your finger through here you can feel there's a bit of separation you can see it but one starts from here goes this way the other one over there goes that way and i have them bent like that and the whole thing is wrapped up like that and it was just a long flat piece that i just curved this way um, and bolt it onto the side of the frame this side and that side so fairly straightforward there's a this has always worked for me and it looks a little beat up over time because it's about four or five years since i made this and i've been thinking about trying to update it a little bit but on the flip side i actually kind of like the way it is right now it shows that it's been used we'll see how it continues to hold up over time so quick recap we went over the entire panel frame build And this is how the view looks like i'm holding the camera up almost to my face here now i'm filming this on my phone so this is not necessarily the best uh, representation of my view but this is essentially where my eyesight sits and this is kind of how i see uh, the inside of the flight sim pit as when i'm flying just looking around all the way left going all the way around to the right to right to the left saying that backwards oh, hello so let's go ahead and do a quick test flight
Airport in the in the forest here in the bushes in Pacific Northwest, and I know there's no tower there, so you just make radio ATC announcements, just alerting everyone in the area. And I can see the clearing through the trees right over there for the airport. It's still a little bit high, but that's okay. Just about 500 feet or so. So 
very low to the ground. There's the airport. Make the final announcement. Set dropping down on the streets. Collapse down. Mix your food, crop food. Support that melt down a little bit. Landing lights on. Snap lights on, scrap lights on. Beta heat is off. Beacon is on. Pop up the coast. Pop steady carry is on. There's our runway street straight ahead. down over this view. Have a right to left crosswind of 11 knots flowing through this valley. So it's pushing the nose to the right a little bit as it hits the tail. We're we'll going to have to fight that on the way down. Not too bad. down, melt down, Just throw in the power, flaps to, over this, uh, this stream here, that's at about 70, let's go for the flaps, we're coming in a little too fast and a little too high. Touchdown. I see a couple guys over there watching. Let's start flaring out a bit. 60. Right there. There is that crosswind. Come on, come on, slow down. Not too bad. I've had worse. Let's keep it on this runway. Great. Script. There's no taxiway at this Bush Airport. Flaps up. Taxi lights on, landing off, strobe off. Let's make the clear runway announcement. Green traffic, one, Bravo, clear the runway. The busy airport. That fence line. in the battery. And that's it.